The 2024 Stansberry Research Conference and Alliance meeting is back this fall in Las Vegas. And for the first time ever, they've extended their early bird discounted ticket pricing, which means if you reserve your seat today, you can save $450 off your ticket. Head over to www.vegasearlybird.com to find all the details and get your discounted ticket. The Stansbury Conference is truly one of the best business mixed with pleasure industry events out there. Past speakers have included Shark Tank's Kevin O'Leary, Dennis Miller, and Steve Forbes. And of course, all your favorite Stansbury editors will be there too, including yours truly. I mean, I hope I'm one of your favorites. <laughs> I look forward to this event every year. It's great getting the chance to meet our listeners from the show whether it's chatting during a break or grabbing a beer at the end of the day or whatever. So I hope you're planning to join us. It's a great event. Go to www.vegasearlybird.com to get your discounted ticket before prices increase. That's www.vegasearlybird.com. So come on out and find me in Vegas and say hello. Gary, welcome back to the show. Always good to see you. Thank you very much for having me. So it's been a little while. Um, we had you on before in July of 2022. And uh, you know, a few things have happened since then in the world. Yeah, um, a few. A few. Um, so generally speaking, actually, before we do anything, let's just remind our listener of what kind of investor you are. What? How would you describe yourself as an investor? Sure. I'm a long-term concentrated value investor. I'm mostly bottom-up, and I'm also a big believer in behavioral uh, biases and mental models, using them in terms of both defense to help myself make better decisions and also taking advantage of opportunities. All right. Uh, a man after my own heart. Um, so what I was going to say before was, uh, since it has been a, a topsy-turvy um, almost two years since you've been uh, with us, like, ha has anything changed for you? Are you finding ideas more difficult or less difficult to, to find? Um, ha has anything changed significantly for you as you allocate capital for clients? Sure. Well, um, you know, hard to believe, but I actually think for me, it's been one of the more challenging periods ever. Um, and I've done this for almost a quarter of a century. So it's been tough to find ideas on the bottom up basis. And I was talking to another investor the other day, and they, the last time I had this much difficulty was 2007, which is not <laughs> to say that we have some kind of imminent collapse uh, uh, wait, awaiting us, but it's just hard. Uh, it's, uh, you know, if you juxtapose quality of businesses and people running them and an attractive price, there's just not a lot there that I'm finding. Now, maybe I'm missing things. I'm always trying to stay humble and make sure I'm not presumptuous that I have all the answers or even half the answers, but it's been really, really hard. I can't say that surprises me with um, the market really taking off last year and, and, and into this year. Um, making new highs, being rather expensive by all the usual metrics that folks use. Um, so what do you do? Like, how do you hang on to your clients at a time like this? Because clients like it when you find lots of ideas and you're, you know, per hopefully you're performing enough in line with the market to make them happy. Um, is is this a, a good time to hang on to clients or a tough time? That's you know, I th I have a group of clients that are fairly sophisticated. That's not to say that, you know, there won't be frustrations. Look, you know, every everyone's human, right? Um, but I think that there's certain self-selection where people who've selected to join me uh, kind of understand what I do. And I think they expect me to focus on process over outcome. Right. I think that the other thing that is kind of important is that, you have to have the temperament to be successful in this business. And so if you start, you know, like worrying about what clients are going to think or what someone else is going to think, you, you're going about it all wrong. I remember my, one of my prior shops, we, 
know, whenever we would be talking to a new client or an existing client and they would ask like, hey, how are you finding the market? Is this a good time to invest? You know, the leader of the group would be like, oh, it's a great time to invest. Yeah, give us a lot of money. And I was always like, come on, man, just like level with people. Just be honest, you know, um, because listen, this is not a transactional business, right? Even if you were to put your business person head on, you're not trying to get someone to buy some one time, like, you know, <laughs> some, you know, I don't know, vac- rent, you know, vacation share or whatever it is, right? <laughs> right. And, you know, That's right. run away. You, you know, you're trying to hopefully build a long-term relationship. And like in any relationship, if someone is BSing you, you know, right up front from the beginning, like, okay, if what, you know, okay, so like, let's say they invest with you or whatever. You know, what's going to happen is at the first sign of turbulence, they're going to want out. So you, you, you're not, not going to do them favors. You're not going to do yourself that much of a favor. And I think my approach has always been, look, if things are tough, I tell people things are tough. By the way, the corollary of that is that when I tell people, hey, this is a really attractive time to add capital or put new capital in, I think I have a lot more credibility than the guy who said it's always a great time to invest. The market, you know, I'm always going to do great for you, right? So, I don't know. I think honesty, it might be old-fashioned, but I do think just being honest with people goes a long way. And also... I really believe in over short intermediate term uh, kind of timeframes, focusing on inputs rather than uh, outputs, because like you're going to drive yourself insane, you know, checking the market five times a day. It's like, right. listen, That's if right. you're trying to lose 50 pounds, which I've tried, you know, I've lost in college, I lost 115 p- uh, pounds over like 18 months. Like, wow. you, you don't want to weigh yourself five times a day, you know, as a measure of progress. Like right. you might want to ask, did I eat well? Did I exercise? Did I stick to my plan? And believe that, you know, if the plan makes sense and you execute over time, you'll get there. And that's, I think, the way I think about investing. Yeah, you know, that reminds me, of course, talking to a value investor, half the things you say are going to remind me of a Warren Buffett quote. But I'll, but but there was a quote that he had about, um, you know, not being able to play the game if you're always looking at the scoreboard, right? So yeah. people are obsessed with the scoreboard. And, uh, you know, as you know, from studying the behavioral economics and finance and things, <laughs> that's just people are just too vulnerable to making lots and lots and lots of mistakes as they focus on the scoreboard. Of course. Um, and so you're in other words, you've you've found a group of clients who know you and trust you. They've self-selected, as you say, and uh and, you know, they trust you. They know that you're not looking at the scoreboard all the time, among other, among other things, which is really nice. I mean, you've, you've, uh, you're it's a true. fortunate it's man. All, it's all, <laughs> well, it's all, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, kind of BS you either. It's also tough to find those clients, right? I mean, oh, yeah. you know Absolutely. very well in this industry, like, how do, how do fund managers sell, right? They put up, say, three, two, three-year results, uh, and they go and find suckers who will extrapolate that into the indefinite future and give them mm-hmm. money, right? Because right. like we, we all know that's not sustainable, it has no statistical significance whatsoever, but humans being human, they're going to give them money because like, oh, this guy did 27% per year over the last 3.3 years. Let's, you know, I'm going to give him some money, right? And so, I mean, the craziest statistic in this business is looking at like the asset weight returns of most investors, right? Because you know, that takes into account when the money comes in. So usually someone puts up some amazing record over some intermediate period of time mm-hmm. at on time, relatively small dollars. Right. Uh, and then they market the heck out of it, get a bunch of performance chasing clients to come in just as the performance is going to turn for far to the worst, right? And my approach has always been, okay, I'm going to talk very little about performance other than longer periods of time. Um, I'm going to try to focus on process. I'm going to explain why I think the process works. And I think there's two things that are true. One is that there are relatively few people who are going to be interested in that because, you know, you're human and it's much easier to take advantage of people's psychology by, you know, getting them to performance chase. But the ones that do come through those filters, I think have certain uh, characteristics that make them much more sticky and much more, much better partners mm-hmm. because the last thing I need, listen, it's been a challenging couple of years. I'm very open about that in my letters. Whoever asks, I'm not, you know, I don't make stuff up. 
but they, and I'm pretty tough mentally, but if you have clients who are sending you monthly letters saying, Hey, why is this thing moving this way? Why is that stock moving that way? Mm-hmm. You know, no matter how mentally tough you are, it distracts you, right? So I'm lucky that I don't have clients like that. And I think that getting people to come in who are not the right fit, who are then going to pester you about why did this quarter turn this way, not that way, it would do me a disservice. And it would do, honestly, my other partners, you know, and I think of my clients as my partners, it would do them a disservice. So I, I'm happy staying smaller with a good group of people than trying to, you know, go and put up some crazy numbers of some period of time. Which, by the way, almost every manager is going to have a good stretch and a bad stretch. It just, I don't like being cynical about it. That's all. Noted. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to be cynical about it. So how, how do you, do you, are you actively con- like constantly or at least every year looking for new clients? How do you do that? How do they I come people to you? Find me. Yeah. No, oh, I, yeah. I mean, some of his referrals, some of it people listen to, you know, material I write. I write a lot. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm not probably the most prolific writer in the world, but I do write. And I think that um, people get to know me through my writing. And a small number kind of trickle in, you know, usually every year. Um, but I kind of look, look at that as the output variable. Um, I think that trying, given that the kind of investors I'm looking for are a fairly small percentage of the total pool out there in terms of people who would, there would be a mutual fit kind of doing a lot of aggressive outbound marketing, even if I wanted to just wouldn't work. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, right. I don't know, think of like some RIA, you know, dialing for dollars or doing kind of the standard stuff. I just don't think that that works very well. I think I have a few family offices, I have a foundation. I have a few, you know, a number of the high net worth families. And I think that I'm happy to expand it at a natural pace as long as the quality of those folks in terms of how they approach partnering with managers is very high. And I think over time, it'll sort itself out. Well said. You're you're a man of, you're a very confident man, aren't you, Gary? I think I don't have any other choice in the sense that what's my alternative? You know, listen, I spent, before starting Silver Ring, I spent 15 years at large firms. I started Fidelity, I spent mm. a, 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 number, a part of my career at a couple of other large firms. So I've, I've been inside the sausage factory. I know how the sausage is made. I know how it works. I get that it's profitable. But at some point, like, look, what is the point, right? You know, I, I drive a Toyota Highlander, not because I can't afford a fancier car, because I like it and it's useful. I have three kids, right? I'm not looking to massively increase my consumption of life. What I am looking to do is live my life both personally and professionally in the way that I'm proud of. And the, frankly, that I could have my kids be proud of it. And when I was part of the kind of the, the factory, so to speak, I no longer was starting to feel proud. I felt like there was almost a zero sum relationship with clients where you were trying to make money off of them as opposed to for them. You know how it just, I don't want to get into the minutia, but they, it's just, I, I, there wasn't, as a my friend, our mutual friend Vitaly puts it, there wasn't internal alignment, right? And so mm-hmm. I traded making a lot of money for doing things exactly the way I believe is right for me. And by the way, I think there are many ways to do it, and I'm not saying that everyone else is doing it wrong. I'm just saying for me, I think this is the right approach. And so I would be a, a darn fool, to quote the late Charlie Munger, uh, if I were, if I sacrificed all of that easy seven-figure job fancy title, you know, all of that to then start compromising while on my own. But I could have stayed at the big shops and with very little effort, right? So, yeah. All right. Um, So what do you, um, since you're not an an aggressive marketer, like if we ran into each other and didn't already know each other, uh, you know, sure. What, and I said, you know, I'm, I've am i got, you know, millions of dollars I don't know what to do with. And I'm kind of a long term patient person. What would you tell me? What would you say? Well, I, you know, I manage money or let's let's just say I was trying to pull it out of you and you and you are saying, OK, well, I'll tell him a little bit about what I do. Like, how would you talk to me? What would you say to me? Well, I mean, honestly, the first uh, thing I would ask is, like, where have you invested in the past? Just that. To understand each other because a lot of people say they're patient and i found that you know people do mostly what they've done before 
So yeah. when you're patient and you're trading Bitcoin or doggy coin or whatever, monkey, coin, whatever, right? You know, <laughs> you probably might be a wonderful human being, but you're probably not going to be someone that can help, right? Yeah. Uh, if you're in and out of funds and you're doing this and that, or if you buy in the latest APO, again, nothing wrong with that. Chances are we're not a fit. If you, if you kind of say, well, okay, you know, I've kind of invested in such and such way. I say, well, listen, honestly, for most people, I think the index dollar cost averaging is a perfectly fine approach that'll do better for you than the vast majority of things out there. Mm -hmm. Are there reasons to deviate? There are, there are few, and they apply to people who can assess the manager's process. And if you wanted to have a conversation and get to know me better, I'd be happy to do it. But you have to be honest with yourself and that if you can't understand how I'm doing a good job without looking at short-term results or how I'm not doing a good job despite good short-term results, then I think you honestly are better off giving your money to Vanguard or whoever is a good low-cost provider because you're just going to end up paying fees for no reason. Right. Um, and I think that if you were interested in that, then I think we would, we would have a longer conversation. But I think simplistically, when I think of my competitive advantage, like if you if you said, okay, Gary, I'm going to grab, grab you by the collar. Like, what is it that you do that's like so special? Look, everybody can quote Warren Buffett. I think many people can, <laughs> you know, read security analysis, do a DCF, analyze a business. I mean, there's degrees of skill in that. And I mm -hmm. teach a seminar of business school students here in Boston. And, you know, there obviously are levels to the game, you know, so, uh, but even that can be taught and, you know, essentially you can teach an MBA how to do a Michael Porter five courses analysis and all of that. And soon, by the way, we'll have Chad GPT telling us that it, it can, by the way, we play around with that. They, it does a pretty decent business school levels uh, job with that. Um, what I have that I think very few people have is two things combined. And those two things are one is a unique temperament where I'm just willing to stick to my process, even when things are going against me and, you know, AI stocks are skyrocketing and all these things around me are screaming at me, hey, Gary, you got to change. And again, that's different from not learning. Of course, I learn and improve continuously, but there is mm -hmm. this human tendency to change because of external pressure. And then number two is I have a set of behavioral models that I've developed over time frankly, through painful experiences in some cases where I have messed up or I have you know, come up short. And that kind of library of mental models really helps me, I think, make better decisions. So yes, I do all the things that I think other value investors do well. Um, but I think at the end of the day, where I can succeed, where I think a lot of other people I see kind of folding to the pressure and saying the markets change, value investing doesn't work is I can actually stick to a process when it's really painful to do so. Most people can't. You know, this is analogous to, um, <laughs> we talk to a lot of traders, like folks who appear in Market Wizards books and, and others sure. who do, do that kind of trading. And we, we always arrive at this point um, when they talk about, they say, well, the money management is far more important than how we, you know, select mm -hmm. a trade. You know, how, where, where are our stops? Where, how's our risk management? What's our position sizing? All that sort of stuff that traders do that's very important. And that's analogous here, right? Because, you know, you can be wrong. Um, uh, and we, we talked about this actually last time you were on the show too. It's an important point. Um, but in your case, rather than the, the money management, the position sizing and all that, it's your ability to stick to... Um, a long-term viewpoint and a, a tried and true process that you admit, like this is not a this is not technically difficult. It, w would you agree with that? This is not technically difficult. the The primary yeah. difficulty lies in um, the the allocator, whether it's an individual like you know, like our listeners, or you know, a professional like you. That the primary difficulty is you're just managing yourself and your own behavior. I think that's right. I mean, this is it might sound like a tangent, but it's not. I mean, there's a really good book out there called The Psychology of Poker, I think. And Psychology of Poker. So my okay. seminar, right. and, and my seminar, it's the last book we read. It's Jared Teller, I think, is the author. Jared and Teller. okay, he talks about so in poker there is this idea of tilt, and what tilt is, it's deviation from your best play, right? So okay. uh, and there, you know, I'm not, I don't want to get into the technicalities of poker, which by the way, the book is not about poker. But okay. the book really introduces this 
very interesting mental model of your A game and your C game. And in the A game, uh, it's like whatever your best technical ability is when you're perfectly calm and rational, right? And and then your C game is your is what how badly you deviate from that for uh, whatever reason, right? Maybe you lost a big pot and you're now upset. Maybe you actually been winning a lot and and now that's kind of undermining it. There's tons of ways you can go until. Which, by the way, it's interesting. Is one of my clients is a professional poker player who has won millions playing poker. So we talk cool. about this periodically. Okay. Um, and you know, and so it's a real thing. So the thing is this: many people can achieve a, a very good A game, but very few people can truly. You can't eliminate your C game, by the way. That's impossible. But truly narrow the gap substantially to the A and the C game. And I've seen this. I used to play poker, and you see some guy who is like a fearsome player, and he's racking up chips, and everyone's afraid to play a hand with him at the table. And then he goes and tilt, and like his stack is gone in like 45 minutes, right? <laughs> and so you can say, well, is he a good player or a bad player? Well, his A game is amazing, but he his, there's two things about the C game. It's the frequency. How often do you move from your A to your C game? And there is the magnitude of deviation, like you deviate a little bit or a lot. So mm. it doesn't, in some ways, it doesn't matter how good your A game is. If if most of the time or a substantial portion of the time you're in your C game and the C, your C game sucks. And I think the mistake a lot of investors make is they keep trying to improve their A game. Not to say that that's wrong. I think what's wrong is making that the only source of self-improvement. While mm. as I think a lot of the easy opportunity is trying to minimize your C game, trying to narrow the gap a bit, you know, uh, decrease the frequency, decrease, decrease the magnitude, because the returns on that, on the returns on effort from focusing on, you know, minimizing your C game, I right. think is much greater. Than, first, look, I've done this for 20 plus years. So for me, you know, I'm not going to make a much better DCF, you know, <laughs> you know, I, can right. I be a better business analyst? Sure. But you know, I'm not that terrible at business analysis, you know, and so the incremental improvements are not going to be huge. But, you know, taking my C game percentage from X to 0.8X could be huge. And I think that's what people don't do. And I think I have a natural temperament that allows me to have a fairly even keel, but then systematically working on that as well, I think adds up to over time a big advantage. The, okay, so this is some place where I often wind up with guests who who do manage money as well, whether they're traders, long term investors, um, and that is, um, <laughs> you know, the via negativa, as as Nassim Taleb would call it, right? Right. The learning of life is about what to avoid, and sure. and you're telling me, well, the C game is a very important thing to learn to avoid. You know, you don't want to deviate uh, too often or too much. Um, from your a game so it uh mm -hmm. it doesn't surprise me at all that we that we sort of got here um that's that's life isn't it man it, it's um everybody wants to do the sexy thing they want to they they want to um engage in basically security selection stock picking know what to buy and and the real the real game, if you will, is to avoid the mistakes, right? To avoid the big mistakes uh, or even the small ones. Just avoiding mistakes seems so much more important than being some kind of virtuoso. Well, you mentioned Munger a minute ago. He says, we're uh -huh. not trying to do very smart things. We're just trying not yeah. to do stupid things. And it's <laughs> right? a big advantage. I think yeah. it was the corollary in that, in that part of that quote. Yeah. I think, listen, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing because... When I think about my early days as a value investor and my journey, kind of like I, I joined Fidelity and I read, I met Buffett at MIT and I was mm -hmm. studying there during the bubble. I listened to him talk and I was like, oh my God, I got to read everything. And I came in like bright eyed, bushy tail, you know, you know, you know, like the most people who are most zealous about their religion are the, the new converts, right? So I was this new convert to the value investing religion. And I literally thought everybody who didn't do value investing is stupid. You do value <laughs> investing in this specific way and so forth and so forth. And then I made some pretty big mistakes. And I, the introspection and understanding of like, why did this not work? Well, it was cheap. I did what I thought I was supposed to do. What happened? And I, thinking through that and cycling through that knowledge and like kind of that cycle of self-improvement, well, okay, you know, doubling down, doubling down on a levered, modest quality at best, 
uh, but cheap stock. Terrible idea, especially when thesis, thesis is working, right? But to a young value investor, like, well, I'm disciplined. I'm supposed to do this. And so I'm going to be disciplined and double that, right? So, um, and then by the time you get to the bottom, it's like you lost so much money that you can't think straight, right? And you're like, what happened? Like, uh, what is value investing again? And so I think that having both guardrails for yourself to keep yourself calm, but also understanding that, look, investing at its heart is two things. It's processing information, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it is um, self-control to act on that information, right? And I think that the, a lot of us investors think of investing in this like, okay, we do a bunch of work and we make a buy decision. Right. And then, you know, we have some rules and maybe they'll tell us when to sell. But a lot of the decisions are in the middle because, you know, and not to geek out on you, but like, you know, Bayesian updating, like, Bay, you know, Bayes theorem, you know, basically, it's, you know, you say, okay, you have some hypothesis, which is your prior, and you have some new information, and that new information, you should update your hypothesis in making it more or less likely, right? Now, not talking about, a, like, an actual math formula here, but just, like, as a framework for thinking, right? You have a thesis, constantly you have new information, most of it is noise, but some of it is not, and you have to keep updating your thesis. And I think that is one of the things that we value investors have a pretty poor record overall is like we anchor so heavily on our prior, on our initial, you know, value range, whatever decision mm -hmm. that it just, we, that's how, that's why people talk about value traps. There's really no such thing as a value trap. There is a thing as a practitioner failing to update the value as the business is eroding and they're putting more money in because they haven't processed the information correctly that this business is less valuable than they thought. Perhaps a lot, so much more less valuable that they should sell it immediately at a lower price, even though there will be a realized loss, which by the way, as I'm sure you know that, right? We, we hate taking realized losses. And oh, I'm yeah. not a trader, but I read trading books you've read. And one of the things yeah. that struck me is how good those guys are at cutting their losses oh, very, yeah. very quickly. They might be intuitive with this, right? They might like have this sense, I just have to cut the loss. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter why it's not working. I'm just going to cut it. But I think we can do a little bit better because as value investors, we should understand the why. But we need to not be ashamed to quickly change our minds. And I think that's one of the things where behavioral models can help. Yeah, not be ashamed to change your mind. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Because... What, after all, is the shame in changing one's mind when you have new updated information? But it is a human foible, isn't it? It's just uh, changing one's mind is, is hard. You feel like uh, it's, it's the same pressure as the pressure to change your mind when everyone else wants to buy all the stuff that, that you're not buying. Um, well, there's that, but oddly. there's also an extra nuance, right? Because it's easy if you have the excuse that you have new information. Right. What if you don't have new information? Are you no longer allowed to change your mind? You should still be able to change your mind because, you know, and this was hard for me. You know, like you, you basically, you know, say, well, there's no new information. I can't tell my clients something new happened and therefore I'm changing my mind. Like you have to tell them, hey, I reanalyzed the same set of facts and I think I was wrong. Let's let's paint right behaviorally. That's very right. hard for us to do. Yeah, right. I, I it's um the the insight piece can change. The facts can be identical. You can analyze you yeah. analyze them one time and you say, hey, let's buy this. You analyze them a second time, you say, I don't want to buy. I don't want to own this. And it's and it is perfectly I, I mean, valid. I remember, yeah, I remember a conversation. Tom Gaynor from Markel. Uh, he, they used to have these small little brunches in Omaha after the, uh, the day after Berkshire meeting. Now it's like. A giant production. Yeah. I, I enjoy it quite a bit more when it was at the Marriott with the free omelets, which is what hooked me initially. But I remember during the financial crisis, Tom Gaynor said, we own Citigroup. It was a big position. We're selling Citigroup, not because something has changed, but because we just realized that we didn't know what we were doing and we never should have owned it. Um, and I thought that was a very honest, brave thing to say publicly because it's not like, well, we were fooled and or... You know, these guys, managers, management was doing something obnoxious that we don't like. It's like, no, we just, we fooled ourselves and we're fixing it now by changing our mind. I was like, wow, yeah, that's impressive.
Yeah. Yeah. And talk about a, a value trap of a bet. I mean, of all the big banks, um, that one, <laughs> uh, it's interesting too. The guy has, you know, a lot of responsibility. He's famous. He's been very successful. Um, and, and he stood up and said, we didn't know what we were doing when we bought it. Um, that's, that's gutsy and honest. And it, it's, it builds instant credibility, doesn't it? I think it does. But it also, I mean, listen, you don't want to keep doing stuff where you have no idea what you're doing. Because at some point, <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, at some point, like, okay, listen, my friend, you know, start doing things, you know, right. But right. I think, you know, the way he handled it, communicating that, that was kind of, uh, you know, pretty, I would say, it's inspirational. Like, okay, this is a person's behavior that I would like to emulate. Just be honest, be upfront, and just say, hey, we made a, we made a decision mistake. You know, right. we, we, what would be worse than making that mistake is perseverating and not changing your mind. Right. And the other part you want to imitate is the consistent long-term success, right? That's, let's not forget that part. That's a key ingredient. <laughs> yeah. But I think, again, I think, you know, like I think Tom would, and I'm not a huge, it's not like I'm, you know, have a ton of knowledge of Tom outside of his public statements, but I don't think he's right. trying to portray himself as some amazingly clever investor. Just no. back to your Charlie Munger point. I yeah. think he's just trying to say, hey, we do the basics well. We stay rational, stay within the circle of competence and just avoid stupid things, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was, I don't know, I, I was not trying to be flip. I was just saying that the um, the credibility is the contrast of someone who does a great job in whatever you're right. doing, this is not just money management, and is willing to step forward and say, I shouldn't have done that. I didn't know what I was doing. Right? It's, it, but it's like you said, you don't want to say this, you know, if you're a money manager, you don't want to be saying this every quarter or something. Right? Oh, but we didn't know what we were right. doing. We didn't know what we we're doing. You have, a limited yeah. number, you have a limited budget of, I was stupid yeah. kind of public statement. <laughs> right. Right. And I, you know, I often think about, um, I, I think about Buffett in that regard, and I think, you know, um, he's obviously like, you know, some people will call him the greatest investor of, of his generation or the greatest living investor or things like that. Certainly one of the greatest, if there is a, if there is any objective way to establish the greatest. Sure. Um, and, and he certainly knows that. He certainly knows the degree of his, his skill, you know. He knows how good he is, and very consistently has built this reputation of this kind of humble guy. But if there's anybody who might be guilty of humble bragging, I think it's him. I think he almost overdoes it. <laughs> I mean, just a personal viewpoint, but it, it's um, at this point, it's like, it's, he's so obviously fantastic at this. I think, okay, Warren, we know you, you, you make mistakes. You're not perfect. You're, you're trying to keep our expectations low because the Berkshire is a giant, you know, Right. entity now but <laughs> you can go too far in both directions i guess is what i'm saying um no i think right you don't you don't want to have you know you don't want to put on airs to be humbler than you are but i also think listen investing is a humbling business right oh yeah every you know like, here's a few little tidbits you know start with the left you know when i was at fidelity anthony bolton came who was the head of like the main investor at fidelity international and he has an incredible long-term record and uh, he came to talk to all of us and he put up his record and he said well guys here I st he started in the 80s and in the early 90s he had three years of massive underperformance versus the S&P and he said let's be honest here if I had started in the early 90s with those three years I wouldn't be talking to you here right now because Mr. Johnson would have fired me a long time ago right and so there is a lot of randomness to that you know which is, goes back to the cynicism of marketing three-year numbers uh, to unsuspecting suckers who then chase performance, right? Is that, you know, here's an, he didn't get worse. He arguably got better. But if he hadn't had that decade of credibility under his belt, he would have been, you wouldn't have heard of him. Uh, and, you know, by the way, I think he has a, a very good book out, you know, about investing against the tide or something like that, uh, about international investing. Um, but, you know, a more another example is Char actually Charlie Munger. Like, I don't know if you know this, you probably do, but either way, like 
if you look at Mugler's record, the last three years of his, you know, like he like dropped like 50% or something like that, much worse than the market. Mm -hmm. And you, if you had only looked at those three years, and if you were looking at someone's, uh, looking at, if you were like an allocator, right, at mm -hmm. some endowment, and you were given these three years, you would say, well, this. This is an obvious monkey, you know, doesn't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They're uh, they're supposed to be a value investor. They're down, you know, fifty three percent. The market is down twenty eight percent. This guy is he's downside market capture. You know, there'll be a whole bunch of bullshit, right? Right. And they'll be talking about one of the other great investors of the gen uh, of the century, right? Um, in that back to that seem to love, we're all fooled by randomness, and we want to create a narrative out of short term data points. The reality is. If you invest for a long time, you will be guaranteed or nearly guaranteed to be humble uh, for uh, for a meaningful period of time at some point, or multiple points. So, yeah, multiple yeah. points I over. I think uh, Buffett might be overdoing it with his Midwestern awe shocks or not, but I think that <laughs> there is a legitimate amount of humility that every investor needs because they're going to be humble, whether they right. want to or not. Yeah, and he knows that he's a, uh, you know, he knows he's a role model. He's fully embraced his his um, status as a role model. So there's that too, and I and I get that. And he knows new people are discovering him all the time. So there's other dynamics right. there. Um, sure, but uh, you know, you, you can go too far in either direction. Gary, it's actually time to ask our final question, which um, you you've done it before. I hope you don't remember it. Um, because it works better that way. I know. <laughs> Good. Um, so it's the same question for every guest, no matter what the topic, even if it's a non-financial topic. And if you've already right. said the answer, by all means, feel free to repeat it. So the question is simply, if you could leave our listener with a single thought today, what would it be? You know, I've kind of, you know, I think that the more I spend time, you know, meditating, you know, learning how to be, a better father, you know, learning how to be a better investor. As corny as this might sound, it's like knowing yourself and knowing like what makes you happy and sad. Like wh what is your happy place? What, like a lot of times we have these standardized mental models of what we should be doing or where we should be, whether it's in life. What like, And I think there's so little first principles thinking in life. And I think that if you marry the idea that you should think from first principles about what makes sense for you with truly like deeply like thinking about what makes you happy, whether it could be money management, it's like, okay, it doesn't matter what the absolute best way to invest is. What are you going to be able to do well with given your mental profile and all of that? It also doesn't necessarily matter. It doesn't matter, you know, a whole bunch of things don't matter unless they matter to you. And I think that I'm going to be 45 and, you know, all this, you know, gray hair is probably added through the last few years of the market. But I think like having gone through personal challenges, through family challenges, through professional challenges, and, and also obviously the ups of all of those areas, I feel like I've made progress on the journey to understanding myself better. Mm -hmm. And I think you can't really succeed unless you dig deep inside and say like, who am I and what do, what do I want? What gives me a sense of validation in life uh, or in this domain of life? And again, sounds corny and whatnot, but I think that if you start with that, a lot of things become easier. Where to work, where to invest, how to spend your time, who to spend your time with, where to live, you know, all of those things start to line up faster if you start with like, that in and uh, discovery again, a little foo foo, but no, no, no. That's what I would think about. It's actually a very good answer, Gary. Thank you for it. And I want our listener to know. Um, I didn't know that Gary was going to say that, and I reason I'm neither saying did that I. is <laughs> yeah, there. You go. Neither did he. And the reason I'm telling you that is because we we've, we've had other interviews recently with um, guests who, whether it was during the final question or not. Um, touched on the uh, used almost the exact same words okay so i did this, not i promise i did not cut no disrespect to your podcast but i did not yeah. prepare by listening to the prior interviews so uh, okay. i'm guilty of that but 
it's yeah. an honest answer that I think a lot about for myself. There you go. Um, so it's it's just one of the themes, like many themes have come up on the show um, over the years, and and this is certainly one of them. Know yourself. So thanks for that answer, and thanks for being here, Gary. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Likewise. Thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate it. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.